Right up from the Capitol as debate is underway in a series of controversial Republican proposals. A Middleton teen accused of sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl is in court. We'll have the very latest. And what the Packers front office is saying about the future of the organization after the firing of head coach Mike McCarthy. This is News 3 at 5. Thanks for staying with News 3. Debate is underway tonight at the Capitol on a series of controversial Republican proposals. The powers of the governor and attorney general would be heavily weakened under these plans. Rose Schmidt joins us live from the state capitol after a day of protests that is far from over. Rose? That's right. Now, there are echoes throughout this building that the outcry here today is similar to protests that happened eight years ago after Governor Scott Walker took office. With Walker now on his way out, Republican leaders are taking up controversial legislation once again. Half a dozen bills are being taken up before the state's budget committee today, where people have packed a main hearing room and filled over full rooms. Several protesters have been removed for outbursts. Now, a number of Tony Evers and Josh Call's powers would be restricted or taken away under these plans, including control over the state's job creation agency, which Evers has said he would get rid of. Top GOP leaders are arguing that incoming Democrats will undo the work they've done. Uh, the number one priority for us is to make sure that we restore the balance of powers between the two co-equal branches of government. We want to ensure that the new administration doesn't try to work around the legislature and rule from the East Wing. Ever in the history of the state of Wisconsin has there been an extraordinary session convened to take away the powers of a newly elected governor and a newly elected attorney general. Democrats are insisting today that this is unprecedented. The last time there was a lame duck session in Wisconsin was in 2010, when Democrats tried to pass union contracts before Walker and Republicans took power over the state legislature. Now, it will likely be a long night here tonight as members of the public are allowed to testify before joint finance until 9.30 tonight. After that, they say they're going to cut off testimony and they plan to take a vote on these bills. The state assembly and Senate will take them up on the floor tomorrow. Rose Schmidt, live at the Capitol. Thank you, Rose. Now, now, another controversial bill being considered as part of this package would move the 2020 presidential primary to March in order to help a conservative Supreme Court candidate. The Wisconsin Elections Commission is meeting and the meeting there is sending written testimony to the Finance Committee calling moving that primary, quote, extraordinarily difficult. Some clerks have said it would be impossible in part because of over overlapping voter registration and absentee ballot deadlines. It will be very hard for the commission to do anything other than point out the myriad problems because that's our role and we can see the problems. And the commission is estimating it could cost at least $7 million to move the primary and cause a logistical nightmare for clerks. Republicans have said they want to move the primary, which will decide which Democrat will run against President Trump because it could affect the spring Supreme Court election. Governor Walker is not signaling directly whether he'll sign these bills if they do come to his desk. This is after Governor-elect Tony Evers has said he's looking at all options of what to do if they pass. Chief political reporter Jessica Arp has the latest on the back and forth here, Jess. Well, yeah, Governor Walker at this point is not saying directly what bills he will or won't sign, but says he expects what shows up on his desk to change from what's proposed right now. Governor Walker speaking to reporters following a re following reading to children and a ceremonial menorah lighting at the executive residence. Walker signaled that he could see reasons for moving the 2020 presidential primary and said some of the bills changing the power of the governor are things he's doing already, but he wouldn't say whether he'd support specific measures. Again, it depends on what they send me. I, I would imagine they're having a long hearing today, and they're going to have a long vote tomorrow. I, I wouldn't be surprised if a number of things that were in that package either were altered or changed in one form or another before they got to our desk sometime later this week. November 6th, we had a change. The people of Wisconsin voted for a change. They voted for me for governor and Josh Call for uh, the attorney general. And I believe this is, this is just an opportunity to turn back the clock and to nullify the, uh, the impact of the vote. Evers making those remarks on the package of bills in Wausau today. Now, with that timeline that Rose described on these bills, and as Walker said, it's possible these could land on his desk later this week. He would have a few days to decide whether to sign those bills. All right, thanks, Jess. Thanks, Jess. All right, let's take a look at your first alert weather. Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti is joining us with our first alert forecast. Gary?
cold week. In fact, uh, temperatures are going to stay below normal, not only for the rest of this week, but into at least the first part of next week. Visible cloud track. You can see plenty of clouds. That just keeps the sun away during the day. And as we look at Doppler track, underneath those clouds, very little in the way of snow flurries. So not looking for anything to, uh, to fall to the ground uh, like yesterday. Low temperatures this morning held up because of the cloud cover, generally in the upper 20s to around 30. But take a look at the current temperature or the high temperatures, <laughs> just barely a couple of degrees above the early morning low temperatures. And the current temperatures are now back down to those low temperatures for the day. You factor in the winds and wind chills right now are generally in the lower 20s. Otherwise, look for those temperatures to gradually fall off to the uh, lower 20s by early tomorrow morning. Expect plenty of clouds. High temperature tomorrow, another cold day at 29. That's your first alert forecast. All right, Gary, thank you. We're learning more tonight about events that led to a Middleton teen being formally charged with sexual assault of a child. Our Madeline O'Neill is back from court where 18-year-old Mohammed Altashak appeared in front of a judge this morning. She's here now to tell us more. Maddie. Hi, well, we just got that criminal complaint today. It alleges both Aldershock and an unnamed 16-year-old boy sexually assaulted their classmate, a 14-year-old girl, after they smoked marijuana together. Aldershock appeared in court today. Court documents say after a high school basketball game on November 21st, he went to hang out with a 16-year-old boy and two 14-year-old girls off school grounds at a town of Middleton home. While there, the 14-year-old victim told investigators she, her friend, and the two boys smoked marijuana with a vape pen, according to the criminal complaint. After the other 14-year-old girl left, the victim says the 16-year-old boy and Aldershock both had sex with her separately more than once and that she was so impaired she couldn't refuse. Snapchat messages given to police show Aldershock admitted to having sex with the 14-year-old and while he originally denied doing so to detectives, he eventually admitted it to them too. The 16-year-old also told police he had sex with a girl. Aldershock is out on signature bond with conditions he cannot have contact with the victim or the 16-year-old boy involved. He also can't be at the same school the girl attends. Dane County Sheriff's Office and the Middleton Cross Plains School District have both declined interviews just out of respect for the victim. Maddie O'Neill reporting that. Maddie, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Maddie. A Portage man was sentenced to three years probation after being charged with trapping domestic cats on his property and killing them. Court records show 74-year-old Paul Greiner pleaded no contest to one count of stalking and the court found him guilty of that charge today. Four other counts were dismissed. In March, a town of Lewiston resident called deputies to tell them she had found the bodies of nine cats on her property. Officers found evidence that indicated Griner was trapping domestic cats on his property. Three of the dead cats have been identified as being domesticated cats from Portage. You took my family member. I'm never going to get that back. He was a companion to my husband who was dying of cancer. He was a companion to my daughter who just was diagnosed with cancer. He's been there through everything. And you, sir, say you, you had no knowledge of what you were doing, but you drove to a store, you bought traps, you bought poison, and you took my family member and disregarded it out the car door like a piece of trash. Greiner was ordered to pay restitution. He is scheduled for a hearing on January 11th. It took 12 games and a loss against one of the worst teams in the NFL for the Packers to decide that they need a change at the head coaching position. They fired Mike McCarthy right after the game yesterday. Sports director Jay Wilson with more on what the front office is saying about the firing and the future of the organization, Jay. Well, if you watched the Packers lost to the Arizona Cardinals yesterday, you knew Mike McCarthy would probably be fired, but you might not have thought he'd be fired three hours after the game ended. But he was, and today, team president Mark Murphy explained why. Part of the timing is so that McCarthy can look for a new job, and the Packers can get in on a new head coaching candidate right away. McCarthy got the Packers into the playoffs nine of his 13 seasons as head coach, but not the last two, and yesterday's underwhelming effort against the Cardinals was the final straw. Murphy says the time had come to make the move. Last year was disappointing. Um, we had obviously the injury to Aaron. I think going into this year, realistically, we all had high expectations that we'd be back uh, competing for a championship and Super Bowls. I mean, Mike's had a great run here. And, and I don't think, I, I think it, uh, it's just, to me, it felt that it's run, it had run its course. It wasn't anything that he particularly did wrong. I just, uh, I think the change is needed now. 
So offensive coordinator Joe Philbin is the Packers interim head coach for the last four games of this season. Philbin was head coach of the Miami Dolphins from 2012 to 2015. He'll probably be auditioning to keep the job permanently. Philbin will also be calling the plays as interim head coach. By the way, today is Philbin's 30th wedding anniversary. He had big plans to take his wife out for a nice dinner tonight, but not surprisingly, he says those plans have changed. He has some work to do tonight. A lot. And Aaron Rodgers' birthday yesterday too, right? Well, some would say some that was a gift, things. right? I mean, right. He's not going that far. No, he won't. At least publicly. Big story. We'll see where it goes from here. Jay, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Of course, Mike McCarthy had a large impact on the community, and especially so right here in Madison. Our Amy Reed shows us one organization that is very sad to see him go. You might not be a fan of the way the Packers season is going this year, but it's hard not to be a fan of the work Coach Mike McCarthy did here at American Family Children's Hospital. Through his work with the McCarthy Invitational, he raised about $2 million for sick kids. That money nearly doubled the amount of rooms available here from 61 to 111. While he was in town for the invite, he always made time to visit with family and children that were staying here. The staff here today said they're forever grateful for the work that he did. Coach, thank you very much to you and your entire family for everything you've done for us. We are eternally grateful. This was a time when the hospital desperately needed help. It was in the middle of the financial crisis when hospital management was worried they'd run out of beds. Now, through the McCarthy's help, they're hopeful that the work will continue, and through the relationship that they've built, they're confident that it will. Amy Reed, WISC News 3. Coming up tonight at 6, Amy will show us how McCarthy got involved with the hospital and more on what it means to the organization. Full military honors and tributes continue to pour in as our nation remembers President George H.W. Bush. Today's ceremonies have been a send-off fit for a president. His final journey to Washington began from Houston this morning with full military honors at Ellington Field Joint Base Reserve. A naval hymn played in remembrance of our 41st president, his service as a naval pilot. George Bush was the best of the best. He embodied the characteristics we admire in a president. Integrity, civility, dignity, humility. And another funeral service will be held for President Bush Thursday down in Houston, followed by a private burial at his presidential library on the campus of Texas A&M University. President Trump will attend the funeral service in Washington. He has declared Wednesday a national day of mourning with all federal offices closed. We have more details today about the funeral services to be held tomorrow for Madison Bishop Robert Morlino. The bishop passed away November 24th after suffering an apparent heart attack. Visitation will be at 9 a.m. at St. Maria Goretti Church on Madison's west side. The funeral will follow at 11 a.m. Throughout the day today, mourners paid their respects at a vigil and visitation that concludes at 7 p.m. tonight with an evening prayer service. The bishop has been praying for bringing many into the priesthood. He believed very firmly in this vision, um, this desire that um, we all would meet Christ. Morlino was installed as the fourth bishop of Madison in 2003. Monsignor James Bartillo was named the administrator of the diocese until Pope Francis names a successor. There's more to come tonight on News 3 at 5 when we come back how employees at Madison Libraries are preparing to save someone's life if they're overdosing. And a Monday rally on Wall Street as the Dow shoots up 288 points. The Nasdaq soars 111 while the S&P is now off to its best December start in eight years. We'll be right back.
Welcome back. It is estimated that every 12 minutes someone overdoses on opioids. Narcan can reverse an overdose, but it has to be given right away. In those moments, seconds matter, and that's why Madison libraries are taking a big step to make sure that their employees are ready to step in before first responders even get there. Our Amanda Quintana has the story. By the end of the year, all eight Madison libraries will have Narcan on site, and about 70 employees will know exactly how to save someone's life if they're overdosing. We've always had all of society's circumstances that come through our doors, every one of them. Libraries have always felt like a safe, open space to research, read the paper, just relax. But over the last few years, employees have become more aware and nervous that that person taking a nap in the corner could be overdosing on opioids. There are not very many, but we've had some close calls. Um, and last summer, we did have a death. By the time someone notices and first responders get there, it could be too late. Heidi Marzin at Lakeview Library has had a few scares. There have been a few times we've had to call paramedics if somebody is, you know, too sleepy and we can't revive them. They might have not been overdoses, but it's something she thinks about and knows could happen. Now she's prepared for it. One of about 70 employees who volunteered to be trained by the fire department to administer Narcan. You really might save their life in just a matter of a couple of minutes. And, you know, just the idea of being able to do that is really gratifying. The drug comes in a nose spray, not just an injection. And if administered to someone not overdosing, it won't harm them. This makes Marzen confident she could step up in a moment of panic. At each library, multiple employees now know what to watch for. Turning blue, respiration is really off, might sound like gasping or snoring. So when time is the difference between life and death, they'll have the ability to know how to save someone. Amanda Quintana, WISC News 3. The company that makes Narcan has offered to give two free nasal sprays to every library and YMCA in the country. Time now for a look at our forecast. Let's go to Chief Meteorologist Gary Canalti, who is on the backyard patio. Welcome Gary. back, Gary. Yeah, thanks. Boy, it really seems like the season. The trees are lit up back here. Uh, the temperatures are cold. We've got a little bit of snow on the ground. Should get you in the holiday spirit. And if you're looking for our WISC weather calendar, we have those on sale now. You can uh, order them uh, by sending us a check for $13 to WISC TV3 weather calendar, 7025 Raymond Road, Madison, 53719. Or you can order online at Madison magazine.com slash weather dash calendar and as we look at visible cloud track today wasn't a day to take many pictures skies are just cloudy it was gray tomorrow will probably be very similar that keeps the sun away so the temperatures are down during the day it actually keeps the temperatures up a little bit overnight just having that blanket of clouds but not much falling out of those blankets of clouds i've seen about three snowflakes over the last five minutes out here so uh it's really uh not expecting uh, anything really as far as precipitation is concerned and you can see across most of the midwest other than some lake effect snow showers into northwestern Indiana. Things are pretty quiet. Live view from the Edgewater Sky Cam in downtown Madison showing those cloudy skies. And as we check out our almanac for today, you can see how little the temperature moved. The low this morning, 28 degrees. The high temperature, 31. And right now we're sitting at 28 degrees with mostly cloudy skies. Winds are out of the north at 5 miles per hour. Over the next seven days, take a look where the temperatures are. Average high temperature goes from 34 to 32. We don't hit that mark any of the next seven days. In fact, we go downhill from here. Highs upper 20s the next couple of days and then down to around 20 by Friday with nighttime low temperatures perhaps in the single digits. And then temperatures climbing back up into the upper 20s by early next week. There are some signs that we will see above normal temperatures as we head toward the end of next week and beyond. Uh, current temperatures right now, seasonably cold, upper 20s to around 30 degrees. Uh, but as you look at weather track, you can see the upper level winds right now coming in from the north out of Canada and pushing into much of Wisconsin. So uh, that's keeping the weather systems down to the south. You can see the uh, snow showers down uh, across uh, parts of central Illinois and, of course, downwind from the Great Lakes. But things are actually pretty quiet across much of the Midwest. Uh, weather track shows plenty of clouds across uh, almost the entire uh, northern part of the Midwest. A few breaks in the overcast up in northern Minnesota. Those temperatures are very similar, upper 20s to the lower 30s, no matter where you go. But farther to the north into Canada, where skies are starting to clear, those temperatures drop quickly into the teens. And on future track, you can see lots of clouds, but very little in the way of precipitation 
over the next couple of days and eventually those clouds will start to break up later tomorrow night and that will lead to uh, perhaps uh, a little more sunshine on Wednesday. Thursday there's a chance for a couple of flurries and then even colder weather arrives for the end of next week. So our forecast for tonight calls for mostly cloudy skies, a cold night, low temperature at 22. Tomorrow mostly cloudy and cold with a high of 29. On future track you can see those clouds lingering for tonight. Low temperatures in the lower 20s, highs tomorrow, upper 20s with plenty of clouds. Tomorrow night we start to see those clouds break up late and that will allow temperatures to drop into the upper teens. Wednesday we should see at least a little sun mixed in with the clouds. High temperatures will be in the upper 20s to around 30 degrees. But as we take a look at the 7 to 10 day forecast, you'll see those temperatures remain on the cold side. In fact, get even colder. 25, it's a, a slight chance for flurries on Thursday. And then even though a we'll bright sunshine, high temperatures around 20 Friday getting up to the low 30s by Tuesday of next week. Toward the end of next week, there are some chances for rain with high temperatures in the upper 30s, close to 40 degrees. As we take a look at first alert traffic, got some slowdowns on the Beltline. Uh, looks like traffic starting to pick up a little bit better in the eastbound direction. That's the uh, Beltline at Park Street. As far as uh, travel is concerned, you can see some delays eastbound on the Beltline from around John Nolan Drive to around Fish Hatchery Road. Westbound delays start around Todd Drive and go back to uh, just to the uh, west of Park Street. Otherwise, uh, traffic moving pretty well on the interstates in and out of Madison. That's your first alert traffic. All right, Gary, thank you. Thanks, okay. Gary. Ahead at five, some alarming new data involving children being injured by furniture and TVs falling on them. We'll have the very latest.
New numbers show 14,000 children went to the ER between 2015 and 2017 after being injured in tip-over accidents involving furnitures and TVs. New data from the Consumer Product Safety Commission found nearly 40 children are injured every day in these types of accidents. And since the year 2000, 450 children have been killed. The CPSC is pushing parents to anchor all of their furniture, TV, and other appliances to the wall. We say take five to save lives. It's literally a five minute process and the anchors are very inexpensive. Okay. A recent survey from Consumer Reports found only one quarter of families actually anchor that furniture in their homes. It's not just children. Around 14,000 adults and seniors were also injured in tip over accidents between 2015 and 2017. The government is releasing new information about a growing scam targeting grandparents. It tricks people into mailing money to people pretending to be their grandchildren, who the scammer claims has been in an accident and needs help. Victims regularly lose an average of $9,000. Frank Stratton spent his entire career working in intelligence, but it didn't prevent him from being scammed. The scammer told Old Stratton, his grandson was in a DUI crash, and a lawyer would bail him out if he sent $8,500 cash via FedEx. You know, a lot of people right now are sitting at home going, how could you fall for that? Well, it's because of the way that they scripted it. They had it so well scripted, they knew everything about my grandson, they knew everything about me. The Federal Trade Commission says the criminals do their research. People over 70 are increasingly being scammed. The FTC says if you get a call like this, get in touch with the family member before sending any money and be very careful what you post on social media. They're using social media to do their research yeah, as well. Yeah, they are very convincing. Stay with us. We'll have another check of your forecast in just a moment.
corner it? Well, there's the uh, forecast over the next 10 days. Other than the end of it, it's looking pretty cold, but not much in the way of precipitation. Just a few flurries on Thursday. By the end of next week, maybe some rain showers, but warmer weather possible after that. All right, we're back in 30 minutes for News 3 at 6. The CBS Evening News coming your way next. Stay tuned.